It is officially summer, and it's been heating up around the country, especially in Southern California. And summertime usually means fast times for cyclists, meaning most people plan their seasons around peaking during the summer. I know for professionals, we've got elite championships, of course, the Tour de France. And then for us amateurs, we just use summer as a way to maybe take a bit off work, plan for an event, maybe peak for a race. I know there's some championships coming up, but unfortunately, I've been riding pretty terribly. Uh, I don't know what's been happening, but on these rides that I've been going on, that normally take me, you know, less than two hours to do. It's taking me a little bit longer on my one home climb that I do. I'm going way outside the time that I've normally been able to do it. I can go up rollers and down rollers and not with relative ease, sometimes in my small ring. And I'm not really sure what's been happening. So I checked my equipment. There were a couple times I thought I had a flat Uh, I thought, well, maybe I need new tires, so I got some new tires. Uh, But what's happening is more in my head than in my legs. And as Chris Carmichael said in our live interview we did a few years back, he said, good legs equals a good head and vice versa. Good head equals a good leg. And that has to be the case in point for not just myself, but so many writers out there who are a little burnt out are a little bit overtrained. Uh, In my case, it's none of those things. I haven't been writing enough. And I'm noticing things that are not related to cycling per se, but it's causing my performance to dwindle a little bit. I haven't been going out on the group rides. And then off the bike, I'm noticing, you know, my, my kit's fitting a little bit tighter, which means my diet is not going so well. And my sleep patterns are completely messed up. And I couldn't figure it out for the longest time until I knew that I cannot ride myself into having a good head. And you cannot just be, you have to have both. You have to have a good head or good brain or good emotional state or whatever you want to call it in order to have good legs. And I thought I could just ride my issues away. And I'm super stressed. It's just a weird time of life for me. I'm juggling between careers. I've got lack of sleep in the night because I've got little kids. I'm trying to still ride as fast as I used to. And that's a hard pill to swallow for people that, you know, are going, well, you know, this normally takes me an hour to do this one route. And now it's taking me an hour and five minutes or an hour and 10 minutes. And it just doesn't sit well. And so, In Tyler Hamilton's book, The Secret Race, he is has more miles under his legs than just about anybody out there, but he's also been diagnosed with depression. I'm not saying that I have depression or anything, but I definitely have something going on where I thought that if I just ride more or vary up the training more or clean my bike more or change up my equipment a little bit, that'll sort of fix things and and maybe it's a band-aid but at the same time I think some of the things that I need to fix are off the bike and like I said they have to be done one by one so there's a lot of off the bike stuff like I said it's not going well Uh, since I got back from Spain my diet's not been good I mean it's the summer I've been having a few more adult beverages than I should be having My sleep patterns are a little bit messed up, as I said before, which means I've been sleeping a lot more than I should. I know advocates talk about sleeping and wanting to, you know, getting those eight hours. Believe me, I'm getting a lot more than eight hours. And just my general mood, I'm kind of feeling numb to things. Things don't excite me the way they used to. Uh, And I'm trying to figure that out. And I just can't say that cycling is going to fix it. Cycling's going to help. Cycling and riding and being outside. I know that I feel good after a ride. I know that I feel like, okay, I can sort of recenter myself. But then I kind of de evolve into my similar patterns of, you know, not being. And I, and I really hate that term best because you can't be best all of the time. We're all human beings. We all have certain issues that we need to figure out. And if you're at work and you're 
training off the on the bike after work, maybe that helps you be more productive at work. And a lot of times you compare cycling to a lot of parts of your life. And think about it like this. If you train really, really well on your bike for a couple of weeks, you're going to notice some great physical improvements. You you have the, the data that is all there. You can track everything. Your FTP might go up a little bit. Your weight might go down a little bit. Your average speed might go up. Your uh, watts per kilo might go up a little bit. But if you're at work and say you do a good job for two weeks, it's rare that you have that job that's like, oh, we recognize you did great work. Go ahead and have a raise on us or some extra vacation days. That's rare. A lot of times you just, the work continues. And for me, working with VeloWorthy, working for Velo News, being in Spain, doing it, I'm not, you, you don't see those same gains that you do. And I think that's why a lot of cyclists like the ability to track their progress, at least in some part of their lives. I mean, wouldn't it be great if you could track your marriage of how well you are as a husband or wife or how well you are as a parent? Th- those things would be great, but it's it's not it's not realistic. It's not, I don't think there's any way to do it. But I think in order for you to succeed long term, you have to have a good head in order to have good legs. And a lot of times I see cyclists with an extreme physical talent and they cannot get it together come race day or just on a group ride. I've seen people pull over on rides. And and for me, let me tell you, this has been a tough past couple of weeks. I know that I'm behind on a lot of the responsibilities and things that I need to do. But at the same time, I'm trying to pick it apart and analyze it and say, okay, what is it that is going on that is kind of leaving me in the doldrums, a little bit rudderless? I know my purpose, I'm, I'm a procrastinator, but at the same time, it's starting to affect my cycling. And I'm like you. I ride to get rid of stress, or at least to manage stress. And most of you do the same. Yeah, there's a few of you that maybe get paid to ride a bike as your job, or you work in the cycling industry, and okay, maybe you had a tough day at work or in that race, or even just a local small race, or even a group ride where you get dropped by your friends that you can normally just smash. And it messes you up in your head a little bit. And I think part of when we get back into our lives, back into our routines once summer's over, that it becomes almost a reset thing. And I think that's one thing that I want to do. I want to be able to reset and refocus and hopefully have that translate onto the bike. So I'm riding terribly. My life off the bike could be better, just like anybody else's. I'm not ashamed to say it. But at the same time, I think if you fix one, it'll fix the other. And for me personally, I have to be able to fix all the stuff that's going on off the bike first in order to feel in the right headspace to ride well on the bike. And maybe for some of you, you need to ride well on the bike in order for you to be the best person that you can be off the bike. But it, it I know for me, I've learned that in my experience. I'm going to go out there and ride tomorrow. I'm going to ride hard. I'm going to really, you know, put in the hard efforts, but I'm looking at the numbers and they just don't add up. And I've looked at all the stuff on the bike I'm doing and I'm doing it right. And then I'm looking at all the things I'm doing off the bike and I'm not doing it right. So I do have to make those things right without getting into too many details. But I will tell you that life is extremely, extremely stressful right now. And it's manifesting itself into poor diet, poor sleep. I'm a little bit irritable. I'm a little bit numb. Um, all those things, not just for one day or two days, but this has going, been going on for a while that I need to sort of get right. Once, I, once that happens, I think I'll be able to do better on the bike. So good head, good legs, and that's something that you can apply hopefully with you to many, many aspects of your life. So coming up today on the show, we've got a little bit of everything. 
We've got a great interview that we did way back at Sea Otter with Stephen Hyde, the national cyclocross champion, and Amanda Nauman, who is a podcast alumni and sort of cyclocross and gravel writer as well. We've also got Ask a Lawyer with Josh Benici. That segment I'm so excited about because he tackles some really tough, tough questions and kind of gives his perspective, his legal perspective as well as experience. And then we've also got a recap of the 2019 Tour de France coming up next. This September 7th, Mammoth is hosting the Mammoth Grand Fondo. It's located just outside of the entrance of the Yosemite National Park. The Mammoth Grand Fondo takes riders along the east side of the High Sierra with views of the Sierra Nevada Range, Mono Lake, and the White Mountains. It's got three different distance options, 102 miles, 70 miles, and 42 miles. For more information, check out mammothgrandfondo.com or visit them on Facebook at Mammoth Grand Fondo. The Tour de France just concluded, and if you're listening to this directly after the tour, you're probably in that post-Tour de France withdrawal, but I will say that I called it. I called it. And if you listen to my pick before this episode, so my most recent episode, which was just right around, I think it was stage three, I said Egon Bernal is going to win the Tour de France, and he did not disappoint. Egon Bernal is a Colombian. He is 22 years old, the youngest rider in the race, who won the white jersey as best young rider, and he is the youngest person to win the race in 100 years. He is also the first Colombian champion, which I think is going to not only ignite the Colombian people in terms of the sport's popularity, but I think it's going to spawn a new era of Colombian cyclists. Colombia already has many great cyclists. Look at Rigoberto Uren, who is also in the race. Um, He was up there animating it as well. Uh, Sergio Hanau. There have been a lot throughout history. Fabio Parra, Luis Herrera. But the thing is, Egon Bernal is so talented that not only is he has he won this Tour de France, he's going to win not only other Tour de France's, in my opinion, if things keep going the way they are going, he's going to win pretty much anything he puts his mind to, except for maybe a sprint, because he's a pure, pure climber. I mean, he was born at altitude. He's got the genetics for it. He's got the training ground for it. He's obviously got the team for it, Team Ineos. And man, second place going to Garrett Thomas. Um, it's it's great, but I'm sure there's a small part of him. I know he's hugely happy for Egon Bernal, but there's a small part of him that wanted to repeat that 2018 victory. I first saw Egon Bernal at the Tour of California, up the stage, up the Diablo climb, and I think he was just he was moving. I'm sorry, not the Diablo, the Gibraltar climb. And he was moving so fast. He was 21 years old, and he was in his big ring climbing that hill, and he just dropped everybody, and nobody knew who he was. And then after that, he had one tour of California, and that was sort of his first big UCI World Tour victory. And I think that has, you know, he he hasn't slowed down since, and I don't think he's going to slow down anytime soon. Uh, So it's amazing to see him in person and then to see him on TV knowing what he was capable of. But anyway, congrats to you on Bernal. Come do the come do the podcast anytime you are. You have an open invitation. Also, a couple things about the Tour de France. I want to say, number one, I think it's the most exciting Tour de France it has been in many years. I think Team Ineos is not superhuman anymore. They have sort of they they've shown in this race that they can't just set tempo and control they have to play their cards right and yeah they have egon bernal and kiakowski and and moscon and and garrett thomas but they are not this invincible team that they once were where they're leaving every other team scratching their heads and i will say egon bernal may be the winner of the tour but julian alaphilippe is a real champion in my mind. He held onto that yellow jersey. He is animated. He's French. I mean, the French haven't won since Bernardino in 1985. I was really thinking Julian Alaphilippe when he got second at the Tourmalet uh, that he was going to win the tour. I mean, he won the time trial the day before, and I thought he had
had it in him to win, but he cracked. And it only takes one bad day in the Tour de France to really be able to crack like that. So, uh, and Julian, hey, if you're listening, come do the podcast as well. Love to have you on. But it was an amazing, amazing race to watch. I think, uh, I don't know, couple couple memories for me, at least watching it back here in the States, uh, seeing the the commentary and then the antics by Sagan doing wheelies across the line, signing an autographed book when he was climbing after he was being dropped. Caleb Ewan, I think he's coming to his own as a sprinter. Uh, and I think Alex Dowsett tweeted it best when he said, Egon Bernal wins the Tour de France by a landslide. Josh Benici coming up next. Are you a cyclist in need of an attorney? Well, look no further because Benici Law Group is here to help. They have three full-time attorneys who deal specifically with bicycle accidents. They cover all types of cases, and not to mention Josh Benici is not only a lawyer, but he's a cyclist himself. He's participated in the Belgian Waffle Ride as well as Leadville, and has sponsored teams such as the local SDBC team and the SD Velodrome. For more information, check out BeniciLawGroup.com or SDDisabilityAttorney.com. We are with Josh Benici of BeniciLawGroup.com. You can find him on that website as well as Facebook, on Instagram, SD Bike Lawyer. Josh, welcome back to the show. It's great to have you. Hey, it's great to be back. Thanks for having me. So let's dive right in. We've got a lot of legal and questionable and certain things happening. We have people getting in accidents, people getting tickets. I want to start with... Uh, Kind of the thing that lit the internet on fire in the cycling world, and that's the Phil Guyman video. For those of you that don't know him, he's been on my show before. He's retired, but chases KOMs. And I found that people, they're like really big fans of him, or they don't like him at all. He's very much... Uh, uh, it's kind people, of polarizing. Yeah, he has, people have strong opinions about him. It's kind of like sushi. <laughs> You're either down for sushi and like, I want to eat it, or you have to be in a mood for it. But anyway, he puts out some really great content and makes some really good points. Um, in his latest video, I think it was posted, please show this. Uh, when I die. When I die, which is kind of cryptic. Yeah. But he brings up the point that in, in his life, and I'm sure in many cyclists' lives, when they have close calls or they have accidents with bikes or with cars, I should say, um, why do you think that the cyclist is the one that gets blamed more than the driver being distracted? So in the video, he's saying like, oh, they were wearing black. We couldn't see them, but yet we have black cars. Right. Uh, you know, they came out of nowhere. Well, that's not possible. They came from somewhere. Um, why do you think and I, I don't know if it's the right term, but victim blaming is such a thing when it comes to cyclists being involved in accidents. I think there's definitely a stigma with cyclists that they're always in the wrong, right? Um, when people look at cyclists, I think motorcycle riders were like this for a while too, that, oh, they must have been speeding or they must have been in the wrong lane or they must have been running a red light because they're a cyclist, that's what they do. And so I think there's just that stigma behind them that, oh, well, you know, they must have been doing something wrong. And I think it's easy to, to do that. Um, I hate, I, I never want to be anti-car. Um, I know a lot of um, bicycle advocates are. And I try not to get there, but with how things are kind of shaping up and how things are happening in New York right now, of all places as well, that I've been hearing about, it's just really easy to point the finger and n not talk about educating the drivers mm -hmm. and trying to show them, hey, look twice for cyclists. They belong there too. Here's what the law says. It's, oh, well, you know, cyclists, you know, no, you know, slap you on the wrist and, you know, you should be wearing a brighter helmet next time. Um, I think we've all had that, you know, you, you're wearing too much black, um, you don't have lights on, well, it's 2 p.m. You don't have a big eight-foot flag. Right, <laughs> right. Um, I, I signed up a client months ago who um, was hit and um, the police actually noted in the police report that he was wearing all black that he wasn't wearing bright colors when there's no law locally saying that you have to wear bright colors. Right. Um, and just like Phil Guyman said, um, I think towards the end, he said, look, that black car just drove by. How did I see it? It was black. I'm not so sure. It's kind of the same thing. I think it's just easy to point fingers and it's, it's quite unfortunate that it's gotten there instead of educating drivers. Do you think that also juries are more sympathetic to drivers just because most of them don't ride? 
if it comes to I, court? I, I do think that is something that clients or that victims have to really think about is that, you know, the jury is supposed to be 12 of your peers, right? But if, you know, no one on the jury rides as much or is in the bike lane or, you know, utilizing sharrows or anything like that regularly, they just kind of don't get it. And so you do have to do an, a, a quick education to a jury. But again, like you said, all their experience is behind a wheel and probably yelling at a cyclist because they're going 17 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone. Right. And that's their experience. So there is some re-education and bias there that you kind of have to get over. And then do you think um, it's, I mean, there's a lot of drivers that are distracted. There's lots more distractions, not just with their phones, but with their you know, driver interface on their car. Uh, different maps, things like that, and then just not paying attention because uh, there's a lot, to, lot more to look at and a lot more to do. What what amount of responsibility falls on a driver in a three thousand pound vehicle compared with a cyclist? Because cyclists have to be responsible too. Sure. So how do you share that burden? Really, the we're, we're doing this in California. I'm a lawyer in, in California. And the law basically says that you have a duty to not injure another person, right? To, to kind of just that get, sounds make, reasonable. make it really simple, <laughs> right? So uh, under the law, cyclists have a lot of the same rights and responsibilities as cars. So at the same time, it kind of needs to kind of play together. So almost look at the cyclist as being a car. And if I hit another car because I ran a stop sign or I wasn't paying attention, I sideswiped someone, really it's the same thing. It's the same you know, way that you handle it. It's the same way that it should be viewed. However, it's just easier to scapegoat out the cyclist because they're different. People don't have that belief that they belong on the road, mm -hmm. things like that. Do you think there are any precedent setting cases where the law clearly looks at a, a car versus cyclist, cyclist versus car case, and they use it as a to as an example to a driver to say, hey, that's not okay. I mean, traditionally, the the verdicts have favored drivers with maybe a slap on the wrist, including you know death on cyclists and things like that. But have there been any cases where the judge is like, no, we're going to make an example out of you? There was a case. Um, I think it was might have been last year or a couple of years ago. Um, There's a, a really uh, um, popular Fondo out in Palm Springs, it's the Tour de Palm Springs, where um, a driver was barreling down one of the roads out there, I think going triple digits, almost 100 miles an hour, and unfortunately hit a Peloton and killed a woman. And um, I don't know how much it was paired with the district attorney and the judge, but they escalated that with different factors of the driver's history and different facts to a possible murder charge. And so, it, yes, it's possible. I think that's the exception. Um, I, I do think it takes a district attorney or a city attorney to really investigate the facts and try to bolster it up beyond kind of just their normal cases. Um, unfortunately, just being a cyclist by itself I don't think is going to have the escalating facts that you need, but if you work into it, look into the facts, I think it is possible. It can happen, and I think that's one of the cases that can help push that forward. So they do take things like the amount of speeding tickets they may have gotten over the past, or DUIs, or any other type of um, accidents with, with the driver. They take that all into consideration when it comes to the verdict in those cases? They can. And one of, the, one of the big things is how to handle the, um, the charge depending on the facts. So at least in California, if um, someone dies at the hand of a car, they look into, okay, was this regular negligence? Like I was texting, I was talking to my friend, um, I fell asleep and someone dies. That's kind of when you're looking at your um, misdemeanor um, manslaughter, and that would take about, you know, sentencing, I think max for that is a year in jail. Okay, now... That seems so... It, a year, I mean, it's nothing. It, 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 you're right, but that's what the code says. So to go over and beyond that, there would have to be factors that heighten it up to a felony to, to show it that is a gross vehicular manslaughter. Now, so some, if you some, can prove that the driver intentionally veered towards 
the cyclist kind of thing? Not, not even that. That actually is the third prong for murder. Okay. If you're intentionally doing something, right. but if something's gross negligence, it's you know DUI, you're under the influence of drugs, or um, in the Palm Springs case, I think that initially they tried to raise it up, showing that this defendant had um, had his license suspended several times for speeding, like 80, 90 miles an hour. So this was something that he did regularly, and some of the language that you normally use for that is demonstrating a blatant disregard for human life. Mm. So if I'm just texting, that probably doesn't get to that level according to the law. Right. But if I'm going 100 miles an hour in a 40 mile an hour zone, and I can see that there's cyclists coming, that I'm putting aside any um, idea or you know, um, regard for human life, as the code would say, um, anything that is intentional now, I purposely swerve into a peloton because I hate cyclists or something, that's when it'll get to that top of the murder charge. Gotcha. And really, it's the same for if I negligently hit somebody in a car or a, or a cyclist. Should there be something different for cyclists because there's a lot less protection for them? I think so. However, that would actually have to get written into the law, I think, and take a lot of advocacy to get there. So a lot of a lot of lobbying, a lot of the right people in office kind of kind of thing. you you would be adding to the penal code in that jurisdiction and that's not easy to do. Okay, Josh Benici, Benici Law Group, thank you very much. Coming up after the break, we talk to Stephen Hyde and Amanda Nauman. If you're looking for a Grand Fondo that is both challenging as well as beautiful, check out the Mammoth Grand Fondo. It is one of the oldest running Grand Fondos at 26 years running, and it has also made Bicycling Magazine's top 10 centuries for its draw dropping vistas. It has 75 miles that is completely closed to traffic, not to mention at the end, there are awards for the fastest male finisher, fastest female, as well as fastest team finisher. You have three fantastic options to choose from at 102 miles for you super strong people out there, 70 miles, as well as 42 miles. Each participant is given a great pair of event socks, free professional event photos, and not to mention a post-ride meal plus music in the village at Mammoth. And my personal favorite, you get a beer to go with that as well. Check them out at mammothgrandfondo.com or on Facebook at Mammoth Grand Fondo. Stephen Hyde is a three-time national, two-time Conti cyclocross champ for Cannondale, presented by cyclocrossworld.com. He's shredder of NAR and recreational record junkie, and he's an all-around great guy. I think he is the rider to beat when cyclocross season, and we're already talking about cyclocross season. That's crazy. It's still technically July, uh, but he is somebody who is a champion and he is a rider to be. He is at the top step of the American cyclocross scene, and he also mixes it up in Europe as well. Amanda Nauman is also a cyclocross rider, but she also does well at the long gravel events. I saw her at Belgian Waffle Ride. I saw her at Dirty Kanza, and I've also seen her rip it up in the cyclocross scene as well. She is also a rider you cannot forget about when it comes to somebody who is a threat in any race. I was fortunate, down, uh, fortunate enough to sit down with both of them back at Sea Otter. We are here at Sea Otter in the Muscle Monster booth with none other than Steve and I and Amanda Panda How are you guys doing today? Awesome, man. Hi, Brian. <laughs> Amanda Amanda's an alumni of the show. She's been on it before. And uh, she is uh, quite the uh, cyclocross gravel. And you are also cyclocross. Are you doing gravel? So I'll be doing some gravel and, uh, and XC stuff, yeah. Okay. Yeah. When, uh, what? Off road only for this guy. So what events? Uh, this year I'll be doing the Carson City Off Road. Uh, I'll be doing BC Bike Race uh, in a co-ed team with uh, my teammate Katie Antonio. Uh, I will be at uh, Vermont Overland and uh, a few other select events this year. No. Okay. Amanda, what about you? What events are you doing for 2019? Uh, Belgium Waffle Ride, Dirty Kanza, uh, Michigan Coast to Coast. Um, and I might do Gravel Worlds this year. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Just train through it. Yeah. Just, yeah. you know, don't even peek for it. 
Nice. Peak for everything. Yeah, peak for everything. <laughs> Ten times. Yeah. <laughs> So how did how did the, your your national champ? That's that's so amazing. How did, how did it go for you? I mean, you are you wearing the weight of American cyclocross yeah. hopes on your shoulders? Yeah, 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 absolutely. No, uh, man, it was awesome. I can't, I can't believe uh, I was able to do it for a, a third year like in a row. It's the first one was just like, oh my god. The second one was equal, and the third one was just like, are you kidding me? (laughs) Um, Especially, you know, I had a really rough season. Uh, I had a lot of injuries this last year. I had a lot of just, like, catastrophes. And, uh, yeah, I just had one goal on my mind, and I I was able to do it, and I feel very uh, complete about that. Okay. So I've asked this before. I'm going to ask it again to to the American cyclocrossers. (laughs) What is it going to take for us to be competitive with the rest of the cyclocross world? And I'm talking, you know, the Wout Van Aerts and, and Vanderpols of the world. I mean, it's it's not fitness. You know, you're just as fit. Like, what what is sort of that X factor, which is a, which is a very big difference between European and American cyclocross? Well, I disagree a little bit on the fitness part. I mean, it, it can be, and if you look at the. Uh, a lot of the schedules that as North Americans we base ourselves around it's a lot of travel and a lot of um, really spread out not necessarily the highest level racing possible right we have a lot of really good high level racing in North America would I compare it to say like even amateur kermesses in in Belgium during the summer I I wouldn't it's it's not the same thing necessarily Um, Add that with the fact that you can do it, you know, as a as a Belgian or a Dutch rider, a uh, French rider, any anybody in that kind of area can just pop into any number of races throughout the summer uh, and have, you know, a lot of really, like, world-class caliber riders at their fingertips all over the place. You know, you're riding the roads that you're racing on, you're living in the towns that you're racing in, etc. So I think there is really something to that, and um, it's it can really, like... You know, if you look at it incrementally, you look at your your training profiles, your training programs, and how that like you know you build and drop and you build and drop. And we just joked about you know peaking for everything, right? Like, yeah. You can't. And a lot of the you know it used to be a shoulder season sport, and now it's it's not. It's a it's a very very specific um, sport. And so uh, being able to like be super fresh when you are going to train and hit the the racing you need to hit it at the absolute highest caliber possible um and then you need to be able to get right back to, to resting and stuff and so i think we're we're missing that on a big level so if uh we either you know there's there's one of two scenarios that can happen is a you move to europe and you live into that system the jonathan page the jonathan kind of that, page that absolutely right jonathan page like you look at it like jonathan would come back to the u.s and like get pretty mediocre results for his his level and then he would go yeah absolutely and like yeah he was national champion he won a lot of races but he also had a lot of like mediocre races he was you know like same thing in europe he had a lot of like average races but then he had a lot of really good races because of the volume that he did the percentage mm-hmm. of good rides that he had was you know really good compared to the you know his, the amount of racing that he was doing whereas you take a couple of people give them a few races to do the percentage of good rides they're going to get out of that is much 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 lower um, gotcha. so <clears throat> I think that like integrating either integrating into the system that's already in place or building the system here at our you know on our doorstep but if you can figure out a way to do that in this giant country then uh, you know we'll, it'll happen yeah <laughs> I, I, I think the landscape too of American cyclocross is it, it doesn't have the same like tradition necessarily maybe on the east coast sure you're from the east coast right yep, yep. so it's got that but in like you know amanda you're we're from socal we have things like the bwr that's just popped up and everybody's flocked to it on, on the women's side is it is it sign of, kind of the same thing yeah yeah definitely i mean i do think yeah like steven was saying full immersion i think is the only way that that level of racing is going to get us there (laughs) like for for the americans at least um yeah and the and the women that go and do that you see they get a lot of really good results but at the same time like katie keo katie compton they still piece together a domestic racing season as well as a european one and yeah it takes a lot of work to get to that level and being competitive for sure 
but it's not a situation of like they're being forced to choose. They they can do both. Like they can do Europe and the United States and still come out of it hopefully injury free. Yeah. And and go from there. It's it, it's amazing. Um, where you know we we we've seen some changes in USA Cycling. Don't we have Jesse Anthony at the helm? Yeah. Um, yeah. He's he's a uh, program director for the for the USA Cycling. Uh, uh, cyclocross program. Yeah. And what kind of changes? If you know, I know you're not in charge, but sure. if you could sort of have a magic wand, uh, sort of things to change within the sport, you know, for the short few months that we have for cyclocross, what, what would you do? I would really, really, really push the integration of a, a series in the U.S. I mean, like right now we're so scattered, so 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 scattered, and so. Uh, yeah, just out of touch with actually having a real program. When we had the USGP, uh, there was so much buzz around cyclocross, and there was so much interest in in peaking for those events and for for getting to them. Spectators wanted to go to them. And then when we had the, the show air series, like it was amazing. Like it was a cohesive unit where we all there were a lot of races still. There wasn't any less racing, but we all knew that we were going to go to those races to win and we were all going to show up to it and that's what happened it's like all the riders showed up to it because there was a big there was a big cash purse and it there was a, a media around it and they've tried that with uh, you know the the pro ex, or the, the, the pro calendar or whatever but it's not it's not a series you know it's never been a series and um right and it's just kind of like who can do all of the races that's that's what it is. Who can do all the races? And who, and who can afford to do all the races? Who can afford too? to do all the races? And then with that, you know, it diminishes the the value that you can add to any one individual race. I think so. Really, getting a, a series of five or six races together, and then solidifying that, building that out to doing two series, and then to doing three series, and then having it this national calendar where we don't have to go to Europe anymore. We can make our living here, and we can build that community in each town. And so each region gets their local series each reason gets their their small uci series and then they look forward to the culmination where they get their their you know their national series lined up in there and it's not just to see one event it's not just to see two event you know whatever it's it's a series that is built up people look forward to it and there's it's a culmination of things is there does nika have a hand in cyclocross at all or is it strictly mountain bikes because i'm just thinking out loud like man you could Nike is blowing up, and it's... It is, and it's actually conflict of interest, though, because the high school mountain bike racing is at the same time as cross. And so <laughs> it's actually kind of a detriment to cyclocross at the moment because I know a lot of kids are, like, having to choose between the two, which is bad. Just get them to shoulder the mountain bike. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and some of them do it. Like, they, some, some get out there, and, like, they do both. But, yeah, if, if they're in a high school series and they're, they're wanting to get... Or a, a, a school series and they're wanting to get out there and, and do well for their, their team and stuff... They do have to choose. However, I think it's really good because it, it gets it gets them involved in the community at a time when it's the most necessary to have kids involved in the community. Right. right? When you're up to you're like twelve, you have your parents, you have your family as your community, and then outside of that, when you're a teenager, you start looking out outward, right? That's when we all that's when we get into trouble because we're all out looking for something to do and we're looking for people to accept us, to give us, you know, you know, any amount of uh, recognition and also like that's what Instagram's for, though, right? right? Yeah, right, right, right. And and we're and we're looking for something, an outlet for things. So, yeah. I, I think it's it's really cool at any level to get kids involved. And if, if it pulls away from cyclocross at a young level right now, I think that's okay because I, I I feel like it's gonna feed into it later. It's gonna get people excited to just be ingrained in the sport at all of cycling. Yeah. Okay. So in my opinion. Okay. <laughs> And that's great, but but it just seems that cycling's going in so many directions. I mean, I remember coming to Sea Otter in the 90s, and the pro road field's over 100. Uh, pro road field this year, about 20. Yeah. What? Uh, yeah, That's like it? 20 to 25 maybe in the crit at least. Yeah. So it, it's definitely a change, and, you know, I never would have thought we'd see, uh, see an e-bike booth as big as an e-bike booth and oh, this Bosch gra- booth is huge <laughs> and gravel and stuff like that so I kind of I, I use Sea Otter as almost the commercial for the way cycling's heading and whatever's big at Sea Otter is going to be big in the rest of the year or whatever I mean there's no more inner bike right um, where does sort of CrossFit into that whole world 
with the whole gravel and everything else. Yeah, well, there's well, there's no more cyclocross race here, right? Which has always been an outlier because it's it's not in the cross season, right? So, like, Amanda, you've come out and done it a few, quite a few times. I've never raced it. No, no, I haven't. <laughs> I thought you were out here last year. No, yeah, I did. Yeah. I raced XC. Okay, all right, all right. So, it's it's interesting. I mean, like, it's hard. I think it's hard to garner interest in a time where everybody's attention is lying elsewhere. Um, so, uh, maybe it's like a cross isn't the best use of time at, at, at this kind of venue. Uh, cross Vegas, it's great. Because, or, you know, like, uh, in Reno now and, and uh you know, because you have it's cross season, and and you're you're in that peak time for that. Um, you have everyone's attention on that, and it's exciting, and it's a, it's a it's a thing, you know. Right. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, like this. It's I've never I've been to I've been to Interbike so many times. This is my first year at Sea Otter, and never seen so much e-bike action. And like, and I know from talking to like from talking to Canada, from talking to all these these companies and insiders that are like. We're pushing e-bike. You know, people are pushing e-bike. And I've been on it. I did the e mountain bike race yesterday. I never thought I would do that. But it, it, it was fun, I'll tell you that. Well, is it a different sensation altogether? Like, are you... Like, what was that even like for you? It was interesting. Because you, you got to realize that, like... It's a, it's a mental trick. Because race is 45 minutes. It's on an XC course. You have this turbo boost, right? Yeah. Everything is limited. All bikes are limited to 20 miles an hour. So up to 20 miles an hour on any trail is enough, right? Right. When you get to that 20 mile an hour point, like on an XC bike, uh, you're going to push at like 26 miles an hour, right? Because you can push it on those speeds. You can really drag it out. Races can happen on the flats. Whereas like once a gap forms, you hit 20 miles an hour. To go over 20 miles an hour, you're pushing a 50-pound monster truck tired bike. (laughs) run over anything absolutely <laughs> so it's but you can run over anything but you cannot make it go very fast okay. so it's very tactical in ways you would never think well, um, were you tired at the end oh heck yeah it was really hard <laughs> i'm telling you we had to do so yeah, much hard, yeah. Re- yeah absolutely like you're just you're pinned and all of a sudden you have to push deeper than you want to go to go a speed you never thought you would be pushing to go like it's it's insane but then you reach these hills you're totally blown from pushing the pushing this bike on flat yeah, you know, or into yeah. the wind right yeah. just to get it to 20 miles an hour or 20 and a half and all of a sudden you have to go really hard on the uphills because that's where the advantage is so in order to take advantage of the bike and the speed you have to go full vo2 up the climbs so it's it's interesting i've never i've never raced or <laughs> really ridden an e-bike but man like rap music, I think it's here to stay, right? Absolutely. <laughs> but then pair that with all of a sudden you're doing twisty descents on a 50-pound bike. Right. Your body hurts more than your legs. Holy crap, just moving that thing around. Like, sometimes it's hard enough just moving a trail bike around. Yeah. Like, a 30-pound trail bike. Right. But, woof. And now I can see why the moto world wants to take e-bikes. I don't know if you know the oh, argument. Yeah. It's like, is it is it bicycles? Is it is it in, in the moto space? Like, where? Totally. What's the future? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's weird. Um, I want to ask, why is, why are the the top cyclocross guys going the road route? Well, Van Air, Vanderpool, they're racing on the road. Is that, is it finances? Is it is it more attention? Is it, it are they being told to do that? And are American cyclocrossers gonna just? You know, are they going to rate, try and race on road teams more or, or be multidisciplined? Um, a couple of things. A lot of it's the prestige. If you're a Belgian, being a Belgian road racer is like, that's it, right? That's the epitome. The Greg Van Avermats, the Eddie Merckx, the Tom Bonin, you know, all these guys. Like, you know, it's Belgian road racing is king. And the infrastructure is there to do it. You, you, you learn at a very young age to race road kermesses and all this stuff it's kermesses and cyclocross there is a mountain bike scene it's not typically seen as conducive to uh cyclocross training cyclocross speed you don't see very many cyclocrossers doing it uh tom musen did it for a long time uh sven only started doing it when in it's kind of twilight of his career when they were pushing the olympics there um in london and um so a lot of it's prestige a lot of it's money you know, some of it's money, I'm sure. But you know, for racing, we all we know how it is. Like, yeah, you can make a living at it, and even the best even the best men and women are making good livings. 
but it's it's more about you know the, it's more about doing it than making the money out of it. Yeah, and um, in, in America too, it's not we don't have classics, you know. Right. We have yeah. Tour of California. Right. Totally. <laughs> and also, if you look at like this goes back to what we were talking about earlier about how to you know how to build Americans or anyone into uh, a, a good high level cyclocross racer. Well, it's also volume of the quality racing too so when you look at mountain biking like it's very hard to recover from a mountain bike race and to get to the mountain bike races you can't put a mountain bike race in the middle of a town you gotta go to a ski resort they're all in these less like really wild out of reach places whereas road you can roll out of your door you can train for it you can roll out of your door and ride over to the race you know you can you don't industrial park crate totally butter. right like <laughs> come on man you can do it you can do it in a parking lot yeah so you know there's a lot to it and so getting to the volume of high level racing is important and uh you just can't do that with mountain bikes yeah then you got Vanderbilt and then but I think he's just that good he's also, just literally better than everybody he could win I mean he could win if he, and he, how old is he 20 25? 25, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. I, I'm i going to be selfish here. I'm going to run an idea that I'm going to pitch to you guys, but I'm only going to do it in two words, and I want both your thoughts. Hornbeck, I want you to weigh in on this. Everybody ready? Gravel crit. Take it. They do, so they do uh, these things called grass crits in Kansas. That's how Ashton Lambie actually got fast, was he was doing these, like, dirt crits in Kansas, and, like, Dirty Kansas came after that. Really? But, yeah, apparently, like, grass crits are a thing. They do, like, a, like, it's the same size as a velodrome, like, in the dirt. <laughs> so just an oval? Yeah, yeah, but we could do a gravel crit would be kind of cool. <laughs> well, so yeah. I thought about, like, you know, Supermoto? Yeah. Where it's, like... Why you do that? Friendly, well, it's you know? like, but it's pavement, but it's dirt, and yeah. then like banks and rollers, like yeah, yeah. do that for gravel bikes. Mini, yeah. mini cross. The course is already there. Yeah. 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 Under the lights, make it a party. That like, really, that would be yeah. gnarly. Ideas been floating. Yeah, like, yeah. We didn't do this on California. Yeah. Sure. And it's essentially the same thing as cyclocross race. And if you look at like, if you look at, well, if you look at cyclocross races in Europe versus cyclocross races in the U.S., cyclocross races in the U.S. are in a park or at a school or something like that. Whereas the cyclocross race in uh, in Europe, outside of the World Cups, are through a town. So if you want to look at it like that, it's an off-road, it's a gravel crit, right? Like, more or less. It's through a town, it's through the church front yard, it's through the school, <laughs> it takes up the street, right? So you can just yeah. plop that anywhere. Uh, yeah, it's I'm in. Heck yeah, do it. Let's do it. Steven, last question. What's the... What's your what's your future looking like? What are you doing? Uh, what's your goals? What what are you? What's next for you? Um, so I'm I'm still on with Canada Cycle Cross World. Um, I I hope to continue to uh, roll the same schedule I've been doing. A lot of domestic racing and um, you know continue to make the that world's program and um, continue to progress as much as I possibly can. Um, I think right now I'm looking at at uh, a real peak at the 2022 Worlds when they come to the U.S. And then, uh, I don't know, after that, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be rooting for you. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda, same question. The future. Oh, I don't know. I mean, this is going to be my fifth Dirty Kanza. I need to take a break after that because it's yeah. been a lot. Yeah, this is going to be my fifth one. <laughs> um, yeah, I had a crap cyclocross season last year, so my goal this year is just to kind of have a little bit more fun with it, a, a little less pressure. Um, so yeah, I think having fun is in the future for sure, whatever that means. <laughs> Maybe it means giving back to the community. Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, I, for sure. I'd like. I'm helping. There's quite a few junior girls I've been helping lately. Um, the World Cup is going to start integrating a junior 17-18 field for the women in the next couple years, and this next year they're actually doing a 17-18 World Championships for the women. Um, so I know a couple girls that I'm trying to push on track to make it there, which is going to be really cool. Um, so yeah, pushing that equality in the sport, definitely. Cyclocross is still a little behind, so it's nice to help push that. <laughs> All right, we'll be rooting for you both. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Brian. And that is our show. Don't forget, reach me at brian at veloworthy.com, as well as on Instagram at veloworthy, Facebook with the same name, veloworthy as well. Love to hear from you. And yeah, remember, 
good head, good legs. That is great advice, especially in these, you know, long, hot days of summer where everyone is going fast and you just feel like you need to do a little bit better. Good head, good legs. So for Josh Benici, Amanda Nauman, and Stephen Hyde, with special thanks to John Hornbeck, this is Brian Coe saying, stay velo-worthy.